Let's take our Bibles and look together in Proverbs chapter 16. As we continue our study through this book of wisdom, seeing everything through that scope of Christ being God's wisdom and power. My text is from verse 1 down to verse 7, and the title is The Lord of All. I love this subject. How is Christ Lord of all? Here it says the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies be at peace with him. Gracious Father, as we take up your word, we recognize that it is far beyond our comprehension. We can read the words and understand the definitions, but as to how this all pertains to your glory and that of your Son and who you are as God, I pray that you would be pleased to teach our hearts and bring our hearts to bow to you in truth as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Not just in our heads, knowing these things to be so, but in the outworking of our everyday lives as you bring us into different trials and temptations that indeed we would be taught by your spirit that all we are and have is from you and that we need you every hour, every minute, every moment. So I thank you for your word. Thank you for the freedom that we have of reading it and hearing it preached. And I pray that you continue to bless us as we meet together. And it's in Christ's precious name I pray, amen. Now this is a popular saying today. I see it many times on people's t-shirts. Jesus is Lord. And I saw one just the other day standing in line behind a lady, and it says, I saw the light, Jesus is Lord. Now, some might think, well, that's a good thing. But what's the problem with it? Well, the problem is with I saw the light. We would not know anything of Christ would not know anything of who he is and his glory, were it not that he give us eyes to see. You can have light shining all day long, but unless the Lord gives you eyes to see, we'll never see who he is indeed as Lord. And we know as well when people say Jesus is Lord, I know because I've stopped and questioned them. What does that mean? Sometimes if you just talk to people as if something is new and you'd like to know what they mean, they get talking. And what I find is that for most, it comes down to that he would like to be Lord if you let him. And so therefore you see these sorts of expressions that Jesus is Lord, but you have to accept him. Jesus is Lord, but you have to make him Lord. Anybody that says that, it's too late because God the Father has already declared, I have set my king on my holy hill in Psalm 2. And so anybody that thinks that somehow he's campaigning and that he came to this earth to try to get as many followers as he could, but now it's up to us to continue that mission, they have no clue as to how it is that The Lord is Lord. And so 
as we look down through these verses, I want us to consider together the different ways. You have to get down to specifics with people. You say he's Lord. Here's the first. Are you saying that he is Lord over every decision of man? Because there is in, in men's thinking that somehow there's a spot in this heart that God has no control over, and that's man's will. In fact, I even heard a preacher explain God's sovereignty this way, that he, in his sovereignty, has determined not to interfere with man's will. That's not what the scriptures say, especially here. Look at here in verse 16. And you can, verse 1 of chapter 16, you can testify to this. How many preparations are there in the heart of man? How many plans have we made? I believe this is one of the evidences that all creatures were made in the image of God in this sense, that God does purpose. God does will. God does determine. And when God said to Adam, if you look back there in Genesis chapter 1, and verse 27, let us make man in our image. I don't believe that he's talking about a physical image here because that was reserved to the Lord Jesus himself. When he came to this earth, Christ was the visible image of the invisible God. But when he says here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. Some people have a problem with that. How come it's in the plural? Well, the word Lord is Jehovah God I am. He's Father, Son, and Spirit. That's how he has been from eternity. I know that people argue that don't believe this. They say, well, I don't ever find the word Trinity written in the Bible. Well, just because that's not the word used doesn't mean that God isn't the triune. The word triune means in three persons, but one God. We saw that right from Genesis chapter one and verse one, where God, it says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the Hebrew, the word God is in the plural. I don't have any problem with that, but it's not three gods because the word created is in the singular. This God in three persons created from him come all things. And so when he says, let us make God in our image after our likeness, notice what follows. Let them have dominion over the fish. So it's in this sense that man was created in God's image, having get, been given the authority over this world that was in that to rule it and to till the ground and to care for it. But it's not man's world. This is God's world. And so when he says in verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. I believe it's in this sense here that he has made us to will and to determine and direct. You say, well, what's wrong with that? God has never given up his authority over man's decisions. In all things, yes, man has been given that authority to will, to plan, determine, but nothing contrary to what God has willed and planned and determined. You cannot, people say, well, can you go against the will of God? You can go against his will, but you can't change it. You can't determine it otherwise. See, this fallen nature is always against God's will. That's our problem. But you can never get out of God's will. How many of us have been raised under that sort of thinking? I remember back when I was in school, people kept saying, you better, if you want to be the happiest, you better find the center of God's will, as if there's a little bullseye there. And as long as you're in the center, then you can avoid all the, consequences and other things of getting out of the sin. You can't. Here's proof right here in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 1. Yes, there is the preparation for it. There are the preparations. It's in the plural. Our mind when we awake, even sometimes when we're sleeping, we're making plans. If you're like me, you're kind of halfway in between that deep sleep and that REM and, 
and that light slave, your mind's turning. But notice here the answer of the tongue. So whatever you determine to say or to speak in a certain situation, the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Capital L O R D. The very that word Lord means the sovereign. I wish by God's grace we could get a hold of this or he would get a hold of us with it. The fact that you think how many strifes and how many turmoils center around words. Next time someone speaks up even for or against you, just know that that word that came out of their mouth at that time was purposed of the Lord. We fight it. We, we get upset. We think, well, they shouldn't have said that. They said it. The Lord purposed it. And we know that because here it says the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Even when people give us advice, you stop and think how many times you've asked somebody, could you advise me or give me some thoughts on this situation or that? Whatever advice is given, good or bad, because the Lord directs all things. In the end, you look back and think, I shouldn't have listened to that person. Well, the Lord purposed it for that time to bring you to where you are now that you might be more aware next time that even in that, the Lord is directing. And it's beyond the preparations of the heart. There's nobody in the end that can say, well, I planned it and I thought it and I determined it, so therefore I get the glory. No, nope. anything that's said or done, the glory belongs unto the Lord. That's how precise this world is. That's how precise the Lord is. All of this teaching that you hear about making Christ Lord, whereby some say, well, you receive him as Savior, but at some point you've got to accept him as Lord. That, that has nothing to do with it. Any that have received Christ, because everything that God does, he does in, through, and by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is because he is Lord and not because we make him Lord. So that's the first way here in Proverbs 16, 1. We see that God is Lord over men's decision. We have no will but his will. We have no determining but his determination. James makes that pretty clear over here in James chapter 4, if you'd like to turn there with me. And verses 13 through 15. Again, these are things we say we know, but in the everyday outworking of our lives, how convinced are we, how persuaded are we that not one breath comes but what God has determined it. And not one step is taken, but what the Lord has ordered that step. The psalmist said, even our wanderings, are they not written in his book? You stop and think, well, how did I get off track here? The Lord purposed it for our the exercise of our heart. And so here in James chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. You look at that, that's a yearly plan. Somebody has determined how they're going to do their business and uh, they're going to buy and sell. And at the end of it all, they expect to be at this result. We all make those kinds of plans. In fact, if you work for any corporations, you're forced to make those plans. How many times have I been in a meeting when they say we need to be at this result by this time in two weeks or one week or whatever. And how many times I've said, if the Lord so wills, because that's it. That's it. That's true. Not only of those of us that are gods in Christ, but that's true of the world. They can make their plans and determinations. In fact, the stock market runs on, predictions or projections every quarter. And if the projection is low, according to what the company projected, what happens to the stock? It falls. If it's up and people get excited, they go in. But even that, the Lord is determining. There's no man that can take credit for that. So it says here in verse 13, go to now ye that say, 
is man making his determination. Verse 14, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. See, there's the problem. It's that people assume that they have tomorrow. How many times have we said, well, we'll see you next time. Always put what? The Lord willing. If the Lord so wills. I know people stupidly say, if the Lord so wills and the creek don't rise. Well, guess what? If the creek rises, the Lord will it. So quit saying that. If the Lord so wills. That's what we find here. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? As I've often said, this may be the last time we will ever meet together in this way. We don't know. One of us right now could go out into eternity. And so how vital is it for us to live in the moment? Because tomorrow isn't ours. Here it says it is even a vapor. This morning I got up and driving in, it, the fog was thick. Couldn't see more than 50 to 100 yards down the road. And I had to slow down and I thought, you know, that's vapor. It'll be here, but now when we look out, it's gone. That is our life. We all say that the older we get, where has life gone? It seems like it's going by faster and faster the older we get. Well, it's as fast as what the Lord has determined. It appeared for a little time and it vanisheth away. Think about in our youth where it just seemed like nothing was incomparable. And now as we age and get older, we find out we just can't do what we used to. And even that is of the Lord. It appeared for a little time. How long is even 60 years or 70 or 80 or 90 or 100? It's, it's here and gone. We don't even have control of that. How on earth can we ever imagine then having some say as far as eternity is concerned? No, the Lord is over every decision. And so in verse 15, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, notice, we shall live. We don't hold our lives in our hands, physically or spiritually, and do this or that, if the Lord will. Now, that isn't just to become a mantra. But here's where I pray that the Lord truly bring this home to our heart because some of us may be going through some difficult times and not seeing the, the, any light at the end of the tunnel. But wherever we are at this particular point in our lives, the Lord has so willed. You can wiggle, you can squirm, you can do everything, change plans, you ever been in a situation like that that every time you change your plan, it just seemed as if the Lord was putting a block in the way? Well, guess what? He was. Until he brings you to bow and say, the Lord's will be done. And say it from a heart that has been exercised by the spirit of grace to know that we're not moving forward until the Lord is pleased to move us forward. So that's how he's Lord, even over our decision. Now come back here to verse 2 of my text in Proverbs 16. And here we see not only over men's decisions, but over every thought. You stop and say sometimes, where'd that thought come from? And you try to, you talk to psychologists, they're going to try to find some subliminal, suppressed thought that's down there and, and finally it's breaking through to the surface. That's why Back even when I was in college, even before I knew the Lord, all of that sort of psychology just drove me nuts. And I'm thankful the Lord did it, spared me from going down that road. Now, the Lord is Lord over men's thoughts. It says here in verse 2, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes. When it says in his own eyes, that means in his own heart, in his own thoughts. But... The Lord weigheth the spirits. You see, this is what Paul wrote about over there in Romans chapter 10. It's, it's not that people have bad self-esteem. We hear that today, that the problem is bad self-esteem. I would say just the opposite. Man has too high an opinion of himself. 
And therefore, when he does not get his way, then he begins to lash out in anger. And a lot of the consequences are not due to lack of self-esteem, but too much. And this is the problem even in religion. In Romans chapter 10, Paul writes here about his brethren in the flesh. He said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Can you imagine saying that to a bunch of religious leaders and even people in congregations today that consider themselves to be Christian? To say my prayer for you is that you might be saved, not that you make the decision, but that God be pleased to save you. And I'm sure many of these thought, you must be nuts, Paul. Don't you know we have Abraham as our father? That's like people you talk to today. They, they go back, no, no, no. I've been in church since I was a baby, and our parents go all the way back. They, they start to justify themselves. And that's really what it means here. All the ways a man are clean in his own eyes. Who are they today that really understand depravity and what it is to be born a sinner in this life? Come into the world, sinners and depraved and undone. That's not how people view themselves, but that's how they are because it says there, the Lord weigheth the spirits. That means he sees man in his heart for who he is, not just the external like we do. We look at somebody and say, that's a good man there. There's none good, none righteous, no, not one. But this is the high opinion that we all have of ourselves were it not for the grace of God. He says, I bear them record in verse two of Romans 10, that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. It's like people say, well, I have a hope of heaven. Well, is it a good hope? Because apart from Christ, the hope, the Christ apart from him, having worked out your salvation and his holy life and his sacrificial death being imputed to your account, that hope that you have or whatever knowledge you think you have is a false hope. It's a false knowledge. And that's what Paul says here of them. They have a zeal of God. They're pursuing a God or God thinking themselves to be wise, but they're only in their own conceit, not according to knowledge. For what? Verse three, they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Do you really want to stand before a holy God thinking yourself to be clean in your own eyes and facing a God who not only looks at the outward because here it says he weighs the spirits. So apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, those will stand in judgment before God, not only in thought and in word and deed, but thought. Who can declare that they have even in their thoughts, a righteousness that answers to God's righteousness and holiness and justice. But many think they do. They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to what? To establish their own righteousness. That's what it is for a man to be clean in his own eyes. They think that if I just make this little prayer, God's going to hear me and then I'll be accepted. It's not based upon your prayers. It's not based upon your devotion. It's not based upon your seeking. It's based upon God declaring righteous. And how does he do that? In his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Will you read that with Christ? There's only one man who has ever been righteous before God and whose righteousness God has accepted and that is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said, if righteousness come by any other means, by law, obligation, rule, then Christ is dead in vain. You, you blaspheme the name of God in thinking that somehow you are pure in your own eyes. There's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Praise God that he did not leave us to our own thoughts. Because I guarantee you, that's how we come into this world, thinking ourselves pure, not seeing ourselves as fallen, depraved, and condemned. 
So where's the hope? It's in the righteousness of God. When it says here, the Lord weigheth the spirits, even now as a child of God, regenerated by the spirit of God, were he to shine the light on this heart and weigh this spirit, he's going to find nothing but iniquity and sin. So where's my hope? In weighing the spirits, he, in his grace, takes these thoughts and turns them to the only hope there is, and that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. That simply means that if one is truly taught of the Spirit and believes on Christ, they're not looking to the law for righteousness. They see Christ as the end of the law. That word end means fulfillment. And therein we can rest and rejoice. So even here, when we say the Lord is Lord over all, Lord of all, we're talking about even over men's thoughts. And I'm thankful that he is Lord over all. Because despite the constant self-justification that is in our hearts, the Lord rules and overrules. Because even now, in this flesh, this flesh is an enemy. And it will trip us up at every turn. But thank God, the Lord rules over even those thoughts and causes us to see that there's nothing clean within us but all the cleanliness, all of the righteousness, all the holiness is in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Thirdly, here in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse three, we find that he is Lord over men's works. There's nothing for which we can take credit. Here in verse three of Proverbs 16, that's why we're instructed, commit thy works unto the Lord. and thy thoughts shall be established. When you commit your works unto the Lord, you're in essence saying that anything I have or do or say is dependent upon him. We're not holding on to any aspect of our works as if that is going to be what pleases God. Commit, here the word commit your works. It literally means to roll one's burden over to another because it's too heavy for me. How many times you've been carrying something and someone comes running up and you're struggling and you're about ready to go down with whatever you're carrying and they run up and say, can I take that for you? Can I help you? And what do you do? You roll it over to them. You say, oh, thank you. This is far too heavy for me. So that's what it is to commit your works unto the Lord. People hanging on to their works are those that despite all that God is showing them in and through those works that nothing can save them, yet they continue to cling to them. I remember reading years ago about, I don't know if it was Aesop's fables or whatever, but that greedy man that got all this gold and all of a sudden the ship started going down. And so then he had to determine whether he was going to keep hanging on to the gold or let it go down to the ship. And he decides to jump in the water with all this gold in his garments. Well, what happened? Sunk straight to the bottom and he was no more. That's what men are with their works. When the scriptures declare that there's none that can or shall be justified by their works, what that is saying is that you keep hanging on to them, you keep thinking that somehow they matter, in some way, either for gaining salvation or maintaining salvation, you'll only know condemnation. So the admonition here to commit or to roll upon, what that is, is where, where do you roll it? Commit thy works unto the Lord. Well, we roll them upon the kinsman redeemer, the one that alone has not only the, the power, but the authority to take all of those dirty works. When it says commit thy works, it's not, about good, it's not talking about good works. We've already settled that in verse 2. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes. That, that's in his own eyes. The sooner by God's grace we let go and roll these onto Christ and leave it there 
we don't pick it up again. That's what Paul said to the Galatians, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. And don't be entangled again under the yoke of bondage, which is what legalism is thinking, okay, Christ paid the debt, but now I can go back and pick up those works from here forward and make something of it. No. Once you, by God's grace, roll these onto Christ, he is the substitute. He's the sin bearer. And he's put away everything that would condemn us if we're his. And there's where it says in verse 3, your thoughts, thy thoughts shall be established. When it says established, that means that you're not wavering. You're not like some who think, okay, Christ paid the debt, but now I've still got to contribute something. Those aren't established thoughts. Established thoughts are those that rest in him, no matter what sorts of thoughts that may come into our mind and heart. Either Christ paid the debt or he didn't. Either he's taken that burden, we talk about rolling it upon him, it's really him taking that burden from us and carrying it away. Even the way it's written here, commit thy works on the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. That's the finality of it. That those whose ways and works have been committed to the Lord by his grace, and he's borne every aspect of our sin and depravity, and his life and his death, we're at peace. That's how our thoughts are established. I have no doubt that when that final day comes, when I'll be taken from this world, that it will be exactly as what we're reading here. Otherwise, this word, we might as well tear it up if it's not true. But since it is true, then we can rest in how the Lord has taught us and taken that burden of our sin and our debt on himself and put it away. As, east, as far as the east is from the west. And so we see there that he's the Lord even over men's works as evil as they are. If he's paid our sin debt, then there is therefore now no condemnation. Verse 4, we see where he's Lord over men's destiny. The Lord has made all things for himself. Let's not forget that. Whose world is it? Everything we have is borrowed. Yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. We don't need to question people right from time to time say, does God have one purpose in predestinating to salvation or does it include even condemnation? Well, he has one purpose whereby he has determined all things, but it includes the salvation of those that he's determined to save, but also the condemnation. How much clearer can it be here than to read, he hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil, underscore it. To question whether or not even the wicked, their condemnation has been determined Lord is to question whether he's Lord. So stay away from man's reasoning when they say, well, God doesn't actually purpose people for condemnation. He purposes them for salvation, but he permits to get down, breaking down into permissive will or any other type of thing. No, it's one will of God overall. So he is the Lord over men's destiny. And then verse 5, he's the Lord over the judgment of all men. It says there, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though a hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. There are many that think that somehow when they stand before the Lord, they're going to negotiate. They're going to, when it says hand join in hand, how many people even in, so-called Christian circles, when they determine a certain end, what do they ask you to do? Like, will you join me in prayer? And they start these prayer circles, and they think that the more the merrier. But God's not deaf, nor does he need our help in prayer. When people ask me to do that, I always ask them, well, what are we praying about? There's one thing that the Lord taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. How about praying that whatever the circumstance or situation, Lord, you hallow your name. You glorify your name, whether it, whether it's to my pleasure or not. 
And then what does he say? Thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. So that already states that there's God's purpose and will. It's going to be done whether we like it or not. Though hand join in hand, it says, he shall not be unpunished. People think that somehow if we can get more people praying for the conversion of this one or that one, that somehow the Lord is finally going to yield. No. It's going to be according to his determination and will. So he's the Lord over men's destinies. He's the Lord over all judgment of men. But he's the Lord over salvation. Proverbs 16, verse 6, where it says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. You know where mercy and truth met together? In Christ, at the cross. God didn't just say, well, I'm going to be merciful to these and I'm going to leave the others to condemnation. In order to be merciful, it had to answer truth. Truth is his justice. And so you say, well, how did mercy and truth meet together? How was iniquity purged? When you see that in verse 6, that ought to be the clue right there. Ding, ding, ding. Where was sin put away? In no other place than in the person of Christ and his death at the cross. And those given eyes to see, that's where they see mercy and truth. Meeting together, righteousness and peace, kissing one another. And it's purged. It means it is no more. So even here we see that God is Lord over men's salvation and the putting away of their sin. It's not that he's up there wringing his hands, hoping that someone will believe. No, where he has put away that sin, it says in verse 6, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. I believe that means they're going to depart from every way seeking salvation other than how God has done it through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Where does the fear of the Lord begin? But in the wisdom of God, by his spirit. I wouldn't be preaching to you this gospel right now were it not that it pleased God to number me among those for whom he would put away that sin and has. And that, that mercy and truth have been answered in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he's Lord over all. And then in verse 7, if a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. He's Lord over all enemies. And stop and think here, first of all, who we were. A lot of times when you think of the Lord's enemies, you think, oh, that's, the, that's those out there. I'm telling you, when we were born in this world, we were at enmity with God in this flesh. And it took the Lord ruling over this flesh and this heart of this one right here speaking to you. But it says that when a man's ways please the Lord, that's where it goes back to his purpose and will to save a sinner such as I am. Who among men, their ways please the Lord? We know it's not us. When it's talking about pleasing, it's talking about his good pleasure. It's God's good pleasure to have purposed and destined and determined that a wretched sinner like me should be his. And when that man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies... That's just describing the first part. When we were yet enemies, Christ died for us, is what the scriptures say. But it says to be at peace with him. It's not talking about everybody. It's not everybody is at peace with him, but those that he's purposed to make children out of enemies. To be at peace with him through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When as we were born, nothing but rebels and sinners before him. So he's Lord even over his enemies. Thankfully so. Were it not for God having intervened in my life or yours, if you're one of God's, we would be just like the rest of the world. Enemies yet, enemies still. But if the Lord Jesus Christ paid our sin debt, then that matter was settled there at the cross. And that is the Lord's doing. It's not ours. We just find out about it, don't we? As we hear the word preached, and the spirit of God reveals Christ in his heart. My, how we rejoice. And I'm thankful. All right.